Our topic today, stealing from God, sounds a little bit impossible. Is it possible to steal God's money? It sounds a little bit ridiculous, doesn't it? How can a mere mortal steal money from the greatest power in the universe, the power that controls everything? Well, there are two distinct things that belong to God that are within the power of man to either recognize or disregard. One is the Sabbath, a seventh part of man's time. When we disregard the claims of the Sabbath, we are stealing God's time. The second is failure to pay tithe. When we fail to pay one-tenth of our income to God's work, we are, in fact, stealing God's money. The Bible says both the Sabbath and the tithe are sacred. They're set apart, and they belong to him. Both Sabbath-keeping and tithe-paying demonstrate our obedience to God. Were it not for Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we would not have the strength or the ability to keep the Sabbath or work for an income. All the physical, mental, spiritual powers that you and I have are derived directly from God. We actually owe everything to him. We forget that as we go through our da daily busy lives. But he asks for only one-seventh of our time and 10% of our income in return for everything he has done for us. Today we focus on the one-tenth of our income that he requires of us. God's economic program of tithe paying has a twofold purpose. Ninety percent of what we earn takes care of us and our families. Only 10% of what we earn takes care of God's work. Uh, it takes care of carrying the gospel to the world. Many people argue that they don't make enough money to pay tithe. Unfortunately, we live in a society built on debt. Did you know that our national debt in two years has risen? from 26.9 trillion in 2020 to over 31 trillion dollars this year. That's five trillion dollar increase in two years. This poses a terrible threat to every single American's future, yet it hardly enters our consciousness we're all living just fine, and the national debt doesn't even come into our thinking of, of how it absolutely can ruin our nation as it has ruined other nations. In our effort to pay our bills from day to day and live from day to day, we forget that God owes everything. He owns it all. And he expects his faithful people to return one-seventh of their time, one-tenth of their income to him. Do you know that our church, and it's pretty much the same across the board in all Protestant churches that I've looked at the numbers, less than 50% of the members pay tithe. Did you know that? We look around and we assume everybody pays their tithe because it's a requirement of God. But that isn't so. Psalms 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. So we're really not our own. And we really don't own anything. It's not ours. Psalms 50, verses 10 and 11 say, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. 
I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. Haggai 2.8 says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord God Almighty. So those of us that stock gold and stock some silver, remember who it belongs to. Psalms 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, we belong to him. God claims ownership based on three reasons. Number one, he created everything, Exodus 20, 11. Secondly, he sustains all things, Acts 17, 28. Third, he bought us back with his blood after man had sinned, 1 Corinthians 6, 20. Not only do we belong to him, but Deuteronomy 8.18 8, says, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the power to get wealth. Many think they've worked hard and they deserve their money. God gifts us with the ability to make money. But we are stewards of what God has entrusted to us. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So God expects us to be faithful stewards of whatever he gives us. Where did the idea of tithing, of giving 10% of our income, where did that idea originate? Some have thought that tithing is part of the Old Testament, part of the Moses systems of rites and ceremonies, and it ended at the cross. How do we know this isn't true? Long before Moses, tithing was in effect. Tithing preceded Moses' laws of the ordinances and sanctuary service and so forth. In Genesis 14, 18 to 20, we find that tithing was already established in Abraham's time. There were 245 years between Abraham's death and Moses' birth. So at least 245 years before Moses was born, Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. Then there was Jacob, also long before Moses. Genesis 28, 20 to 22, Jacob's vow included giving one-tenth of his increase to the Lord. So we see here that long before the ordinances for the Israelites were written down by Moses, tithe was given to sustain the work of God. Tithing was God's plan. It was God's will. Spirit of Prophecy says, Jacob was not here seeking to make terms with God. He wasn't bargaining with God. The Lord had already promised him prosperity, and this vow was the overflow of a heart filled with gratitude for the assurance of God's love and mercy. Jacob felt that God had claims upon him which he must acknowledge, and that the special tokens of divine grace Divine favor granted him, demanded that he return a tithe. We too should give as we are blessed by God. It helps us keep our focus on the only real source of help that we have in this world. Every single blessing bestowed upon us call for a response to the author of our mercies. Do we, when we are blessed, something wonderful happens in our lives, we get a pay raise, whatever, is our first response, what can I give as a thank you offering to the Lord? The tithing system was the original plan 
for maintaining and promoting the work of God on earth. Nowhere in the Bible does it indicate that this plan has been changed. The heaven-ordained plan was designed to enable man to be on guard against selfishness, which is deep-rooted in the human heart. You know, I know a man that once said grace at the table who said, God bless this food, us four, and no more. There are a lot of people that live and believe that. It's for me. It's for my family. Why should I give to others? I've worked hard. After the Israelite exodus from Egypt, the tribe of Levi was chosen to serve in the sanctuary, the sanctuary that Moses was instructed to build in the wilderness. Numbers 18, 1 to 4, they were to have no other jobs. Our ministers are not to have a job other than the job of being the pastor of the church to which they're assigned. The Levites were to serve God in the sanctuary, perform other priestly duties. It was the Levites that folded up the tents and carried it to a new location that took care of everything to do with the sanctuary, Numbers 18, 20 to 21. Well, that's fine, but how were they going to live? The tribe of Levi would not inherit land when they got to the promised land as the other 11 tribes would. The priests were workers for God, and they were to be supported by the tithes which came from all the people. By giving one-tenth of their increase, the priest, every household would support the priest and their work for God. What is interesting is that the tribe of Levi were also expected to pay one-tenth of their increase. Now, they could have argued that, well, all these people are paying tithe to me, the priest. I shouldn't have to pay tithe, too. But the Bible says the priests were also to tithe one-tenth of their increase, give it back into the treasury. This acknowledged God's ownership of everything on earth, as well as supported God's work. Nehemiah 13, verses 12 and 13, the tithe was to be placed in the treasuries. It was a central depository where the sacred money was kept and proportioned out to the respective priest and their family workers. Treasures were appointed, just like we do today. This shows that there was perfect organization in caring for the tithe and properly dispensing of it centuries and centuries ago, long before Christ was born. God even specified how they were to tithe their animals and their flocks as the cattle, the sheep, so forth, were driven through a passage single file. The tenth one was to be set apart as a sacrifice to the Lord. Leviticus 27, 32, we have an exacting God. Exacting God when it comes to dealing with our finances and our tithe. No manipulation or connivance on their part was accepted. They could not run the lambs through so every tenth lamb was the sickly one or in any way manipulate the animals. They were to line them up, put them through the gate, and every tenth one went to God. An exact tithe was commanded by God. If I give more than a tenth, it's called an offering. Should I give less than one tenth of my income, it's called robbery. It's called stealing from God. That's a strong biblical language, but I didn't say it. The Bible says it. 
Malachi 3.8, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me of tithes and offerings. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Remember, in the time of the tabernacle, the food they ate also was tithe because they, the priest had no land to farm. Test me in this, says Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. You know, I have, over the years, I've experienced it. I've talked to many people. When you pay tithe, everything you have lasts longer. You avoid so much stuff that happens in the world around you because God has promised to bless every one of us that pays a faithful tithe. I hear people all the time tell me, I can't afford to pay tithe. You need to see my income. You'll see that I can't support my children and we just can't pay tithe. I'm going to tell you, you can't afford not to pay tithe. God will even safeguard not only our bodies and our health, but our property. There are stingy people in the world. Hopefully not one of them is a Christian. We are told in Psalms 37, 25, I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. But remember, God's promises are conditional. When we are obedient to God, we prosper in every way. Malachi 3.6 says God does not change. Faithful giving brings us blessings. King David said in Psalms 116, 12, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? In other words, not how little can I give, get away with, but how much can I give? And I will tell you, you can never outgive God. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 points out, one gives freely and becomes wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. By giving, we increase. By withholding, we experience poverty. By giving, the windows of heaven actually open to us. God's claim of one-seventh of our time and one-tenth of our possessions. He doesn't need it. God has no need for our gifts because everything already belongs to him. But he asks some of our time, a portion of our income, to remind us of our stewardship and to test our love for him. Paying in faithful time and keeping the Sabbath holy. Our acknowledgement of God's lordship over our lives. Jesus said, give Caesar the things that are Caesar's, give God the things that are God's in Matthew 22, 21. Malachi 3.10 says, to bring all the tithe and offerings into the storehouse. Nehemiah 13.12 points out that the tithe is brought to the temple treasury if it were money, if it were crops, animals, other increases, then they were brought to be used by the priest. What does it mean to tithe or increase? Does this mean just pay tithe on our salary alone? No. If we sell land and make a profit, we tithe the profit. If we receive inheritance money, we tithe on that inheritance money. If we give children an allowance, we teach them 
10% of that allowance, you put in an envelope and put it in church next Sabbath. You know, I, I know one man, and I don't even mind telling you who it is, it's McNeilis. McNeilis owned a trucking company. He sold it. He's multimillionaire. And he says his goal, I, he said it in front of me, my goal is to die broke. He has built orphanages, churches, schools, I don't even know what else, hospitals and clinics around the world. And he said, the more I do, the more money rolls in. He finally started his own bank. And he says, I, I, I can't die broke. God keeps pouring it in as I keep giving it out as fast as I can. And he is a testament. Another man was Harold Taylor. Bunky and I are very familiar with him. He said, I can't outgive God. He's, I keep giving and giving. And the more I give, the more I get. And then I just keep expanding the work that I do. Tithing was supported by Jesus when he said in Matthew twenty-two twenty-three, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. And you've admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought, you, you, you ought to have done, but not leave the other undone. In other words, they were so particular in tithe that when they harvested their herbs, they separated it so that they took a tenth of the herbs to the temple. God didn't say, stop doing that. He said, do that. You're right to do that. But in addition, you need judgment and mercy and faith. He rebuked the Jews for admitting the more important matters of the law, even though they were meticulous tithe payers. He told them to continue paying tithe, but to add justice and mercy and faith. The tithe money today is to support those who work solely in the gospel ministry. If all church members tithe, and if the tithe were used strictly for support of our ministers, there would be more than enough money to reach the entire world very quickly with God's end time gospel message. In addition to one-tenth of our income, what else does God ask of his people? Psalms 96, 8 says, bring an offering and come into his courts. Offerings are simply an expression of our love for God and our thanksgiving for his blessings. All right, how much offering should we give? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We give offerings voluntarily. We should give them with, with joy and glad that God has blessed us so that we can give an offering. But tithe, we give because God told us to give it. What additional principles regarding giving do we find in the Bible? Paul wrote about the Corinthian Christians. He said, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. See, nothing is accomplished spiritually if we fail to dedicate our lives to Jesus Christ, no matter how much we might give. If we're not surrendered to Jesus Christ, if he's not our Lord and Savior, it, it, whatever we give doesn't matter. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. 
In other words, tithes and offerings are not to be an afterthought. Once I buy everything I want to buy and own everything I want to own, well, if there's anything left over, then I might give it to the church. That is not how it's to be done. We give first, then we use what's left over for ourselves. We should plan what we are going to give. We should give with joy, knowing that it's going to do the Lord's work. Another principle of giving shared in God's word is the promised prosperity of a generous giver. I'm not saying this. I'm telling you the Bible says this. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 tells us that we will prosper. We will prosper beyond all our imagination if we give. Acts 20, verse 35. Paul tells us that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. A few people believe this. We struggle with our broken nature. We love the security of having stuff. If there's going to be a paper shortage, we run out and buy all the Kleenex we can hoard and all the toilet paper we can hoard and we stock up. So no matter what happens, we've got plenty. You know, few believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. A man told me that he thought there was going to be such a shortage of paper that he bought CVP pipes. You know the big white CVP pipes? If he bought eight foot lengths, they fit toilet paper. And he filled them with toilet paper and they're leaning in his garage like they're pipes in his house. Because nobody would know the toilet paper was there and steal it when the challenge came and there was no more left. Do you know, to me, this is borders on a sickness? And he thought it was very clever. He was telling me how to hoard toilet paper. We struggle with this selfish, broken nature. We just love the security. We're addicted to the emotional boost of hoarding and buying things and making sure we have plenty for our families. This is the attitude, in my opinion. This is not biblical, this is Ellie speaking. This is the attitude that's gonna stop many people in the time of trouble from shutting that door and fleeing because that's gonna be a time when nothing is saved or hoarded and we have to depend totally on Jesus Christ for where our next toilet paper and our next meal, et cetera, et cetera, is gonna come from. You see, we, we shouldn't limit this verse to money. What about other forms of giving? Do we really, do we really believe giving attention and encouragement and compliments are better than being on the receiving end? Let me ask you this, what about giving blood? The blood banks long for enough blood to treat sick people. Do you know that the research shows that generous people live longer? Look it up if you don't believe me. And I'm not surprised because God blesses people that give. Another principle we find in the Bible, when stingy, we fail to use our God-given blessings. Jesus told this story in Luke 12, 16 to 21. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my old barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. 
take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And man, he is sitting fine. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with everyone who stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. There shouldn't be such a thing as a stingy Christian. It's actually an oxymoron. Luke 6.38 sums it up. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured in your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I have seen this all my life in Christians that I've known. Deuteronomy 16, 17 says, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Now this was said referring to the Passover gifts brought each year to the temple. Have we ever thought what we might give up or pass by and save that money for an offering? The spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. The spirit finds its highest manifestation in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In our behalf, the Father gave his only begotten Son. And Christ, having given up all that he had, then gave himself that man might be saved. The cross of Calvary should appeal to the benevolence of every follower of the Savior. Acts of the Apostles, page 339. Sometimes I wonder, when people ask for prayer, things are so wrong in their lives, and it runs through my mind, are you a tithe payer? It's not my business. But I will say this, if we want our prayers answered, we need to be obedient to God in tithe paying. It is as simple as that. How are our pastors supposed to be supported today? 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians 9, 13, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what's offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So we all need to pay tithe in order to support the salaries of our pastors. Now in most churches, in fact in every church I know, except the Seventh-day Adventist church, the congregation pays the pastor. The boards of elders decide a pastor's salary and the pastor gets a call and they pay that salary from the congregation. In our Seventh-day Adventist denomination, individual churches do not pay our pastors. The Sharon Church does not pay Pastor Alberg or Pastor Hodges. Our conferences our Carolina conference pays each pastor from the tithe money that is sent to the conference. And every pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination receives the same salary, regardless of the size of the congregation. Now, some receive a small cost of living stipend if they're in certain cities where everything, the prices are sky high. But in general, all of our pastors make the exact same amount of money as do those working in the conference. Why, do they, why does the Adventist church do that? This keeps men from wanting to pastor a large church in order to make more money. It also means 
that they will preach biblical truth regardless of the individuals that don't like it because the individuals aren't paying them. And when you run into churches that are mega churches, that are, have 20 to 25,000 people every Sunday, you're finding churches that pay their pastor, and I defy you to find me one sermon from any preacher of those preachers, pick one, listen to the sermons, show me a sermon that's been preached that would make anybody in the congregation upset. You won't be able to find it because I've tried. Why is that? Because they're continuing their job as a preacher in that church depends upon them making the congregation happy. And you will not find that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. I believe we have a good system because our ministers will preach the pure word of God because our elders cannot fire them. They're hired to preach the word of God. They're not hired to sugarcoat it to make us feel good. They aren't to sugarcoat wickedness for fear of offending the members. This ought not to be in any church, but it is. Our system is designed to avoid coveting a bigger church. I think if I were a hired pastor of the, con of the denomination, I would look for the smallest church I could find. It'd be far less work, wouldn't it, for the same, <laughs> same salary and see if I could double the membership. Luke 12, 34 says, for where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. Have you heard the term follow the money? It's true because our heart follows our investments. If our focus is on accumulating more and more money, our heart becomes covetous, grasping, and proud according to the Bible. But if our focus is on paying our tithe, sharing our offerings, helping others, blessing God's work, then our hearts become caring, loving, liberal, and humble. Covetousness is one of the terrible sins of the last days. It will shut people out of heaven. Look up 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Again, the windows of heaven open, God pours out blessings. Every blessing we need will then be given to us because God knows we will be faithful stewards of his bounties. But it takes faith in God, faith in his word, to turn our money and our time over to God. I'd like to go back to Adam and Eve for a moment. They took things that God said were not theirs. God gave Adam and Eve the fruit of all the trees in the garden, except one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The fruit of that tree was not theirs. It was not theirs to eat. They were to leave it alone, Genesis 3, 3. But they did not obey God. They ate the fruit and fell. And the long, horrendous, wrenching problem with sin began. To people today, God gives his riches, wisdom, and all the other assets and blessings of heaven Everything is ours except one-tenth of our income. And that is God's. When we knowingly take God's tithe and appropriate it for our own use, then we repeat the sin of Adam and Eve. And we display a tragic lack of trust and obedience to our Redeemer. 
God does not need our money, but he deserves our obedience. He deserves our trust. He deserves that we understand he knows what's best for us. When I return God's tithe, I make him a partner in everything I undertake. What a fantastic, blessed privilege when God and I are partners. You know, I've talked with people whose spouses are not spiritual, biblical, want nothing to do with tithe. And in a divided home, I know of two wives, neither worked, but they said, we have, we have, marriage is a partnership. I want to tithe on half the money. And the husbands have said, okay. And those wives have taken half of the income and tithed on half of it because the husband did not believe in paying tithe and was not a Christian. And I say, glory, hallelujah, to anybody that can make that arrangement married to someone who does not believe in God. You see, when God is our partner, we have everything to gain and absolutely nothing to lose. It is an awesomely dangerous venture to take God's money, which he has earmarked for the saving of souls, and stash it away for our personal use. Uh, I couldn't do it. I'd be terrified to do that. When we take God's tithe and use it for ourselves, our families, again, we are repeating the sin of Adam and Eve. We're taking something that God does, absolutely says doesn't belong to us. And I urge you not to make the mistake of believing that it's just a little thing and God doesn't care. That's the mistake Eve made. It's just a little bite of an apple. Surely it can't be that important. In fact, God has serious words for those who choose not to pay tithe. Malachi 3 9 says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Is it worth having the curse of God on us because we don't want to part with one-tenth of our income? I don't think so. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 19, where we should deposit our treasures. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also so our hearts or our minds and our money are closely associated in fact they can't be separated part of our daily worship Part of our prayer should include asking God's guidance in how to use our money. If you've never attended a financial peace university session, I'm interested. How many of you have attended financial peace university? Just two, three, four. If you've never attended this, the next time Donald Robinson teaches financial peace university, sign up. It is one of the best courses I have ever taken in just how to manage your day-to-day. -day. Donald, would you say they should all be in that course? How to manage your money. It is a wonderful course, and it'll come soon. Sign up for it. What about good people? who live their lives for God, but they make so little money and they pay a faithful tithe, but they find it impossible to give big offerings. 
One man said he felt guilty because the church had needs that were great. And, and, and he just he paid his tithe, but he had to pay a tiny offering. See, I believe that Jesus showed us that the size of our offerings aren't important. Jesus said that the poor widow of Mark 12, 41 to 44, who gave only a pendence, that's actually two mites, gave more than all they which have cast into the treasury because the others gave of the abundance, but she gave all she had. God measures our gifts by the amount of sacrifice we make and by our attitude, by the spirit within us when we give. Jesus counts our gifts as very big. Again, he doesn't need our money. When we give with joy, we should understand that God is pleased. However, Timothy was charged to give instruction to the rich in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That's 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. I actually don't know any Christians who put their faith in money. The Christians I know are most of you people, and you're intelligent and godly. Stewardship involves more than proper handling of money, even though today's lesson is specifically on tithing. Stewardship involves proper handling of every talent and blessing we receive from God who gives us everything, Acts 17, 24. First would be using our talents for God, Mark 13, 34. You know, if you are a beautiful soloist, but you're not going to sing because somebody made you mad, you're wrong. You can play an instrument, but you're not going to do it because they don't say thank you often enough or praise you enough. You're a wonderful teacher, but you're not going to teach us out of school class. I don't be stuck down there with those little kids every week. You know, what talent has God given us that we don't want to do? We're obligated to use our talents for the Lord, just as obligated as we are to pay tithe. And when you let anything keep you from using your talents from God, you are not in a good situation with God. Stewardship also involves actively witnessing for Jesus Christ, Acts 1.8. This involves being aware of everyone around us, understanding that God wants everyone saved. It's up to us to reach people whenever and wherever we can. Stewardship involves studying God's word, not just for us. We study God's word so that we know it and can actively share it when we encounter people who are searching. You know, these people are being called by the Holy Spirit. God puts them in our path. And we can't think of a single Bible verse to share with them. That's pathetic. That's not being a good steward. God will put people in our paths too. Stewardship involves daily surrendering of our lives. We have to every single day again renew the vow that we are yours, Lord. Use me however you want to. Romans 12, 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. We can't be away from Jesus Christ for a single moment of any day. We live totally for him. 
One final thing about stewardship and giving our tithe and offerings. If we truly love Jesus, we're giving sacrificially for his work. It will never be a burden. In fact, it will be almost a glorious privilege that, and we perform it with great joy. Because here's the thing, one day we're gonna meet in heaven the people that are there by our generosity. Have you ever thought of that? You don't know who's being helped by your money, but we will when we get to heaven. Jesus keeps accurate records. I can't tell you how much I wanna be in heaven. Nothing, especially money, is worth missing heaven for. You know, we need to be generous givers. Our church, in my opinion, should never have to have somebody stand up here and tell the congregation, we need money, we need to pay our bills. To me, there's something spiritually wrong with a church that needs to be begged for money. Nothing we have belongs to us. It's all God's. We need to share it. We need to pay our tithes, pay our offerings. For where our heart is, that's where our money is. So it's a testimony when we freely give offerings and our church is prosperous, that we are spiritually abiding closely to God 